All right, so um, we left off having just talked about strong bonds, covalent bonds, and ionic bonds, and now I want to talk about weak chemical bonds or weak chemical reactions. Sometimes referred also to uh, as temporary bonds. And the reason they are sometimes referred to in this with this terminology is just simply because the bond will form or contact, have some sort of effect, and then will disassemble. So contact have an effect and then disassemble. The first chemical bond here, the weak chemical bond I want to talk about are the H bonds, where H stands for hydrogen. H bonds are hydrogen <coughs> bonds. They are very important. Now let's set that just a minute and review real quick. Covalent bond polarity. Someone give me a little bit of a synopsis on covalent bond polarity. This is simple. <laughs> Come on, your mind is in the gutter. Keep <laughs> your nose for the little bit closer. <laughs> Tell me about polarity within a covalent bond. Right, you can have a nonpolar covalent bond or a polar covalent bond. What does it mean for a bond, a chemical covalent bond to be polar? Okay, so it has side effects. Positive side and negative side. And what attributes to the one side being positive versus one side being negative? What makes one side of the covalent bond more negative? Like electrons are collected up there. Does anyone happen to remember? What is the name of the characteristic that helps to pull electrons towards one side of the covalent bond? Electronegative. Electric negative. It's like you guys are learning. Hydrogen bonds require polar covalent bonds in order to form. So you can see here in water, water has polar covalent bonds because oxygen has a high electronegativity, water, uh, hydrogen has a lower electronegativity. So the electrons collect up around the oxygen side of the covalent bond and they're less frequent over here on the hydrogen side. So we get negative and we get positive and we get kind of these little spots of negativeness and positiveness. So whenever we have hydrogen in a polar bond, which usually is going to form with oxygen and with nitrogen, because of its low electronegativity, the hydrogen side of the covalent bond, the hydrogen atom, becomes slightly positive in charge. All right? So we get this little positive area around that covalent bond. On the other side of the covalent bond, we're going to get that negative charge. But that little positive charge around the hydrogen is going to attract to negative charged regions of other atoms. So negative charges on other molecules. And that's what you can see here with the water. This is the hydrogen bond. We have the negative side of, uh, of the hydrogen oxygen covalent bond. So it forms the around the hydrogen a little bit negative. On the hydrogen side, we form a little positive. A little negative here, oxygen, a little here, positive here on hydrogen side, positive and negative, they attract. And by the way, this is not the letter H. That's supposed to be the, the Greek symbol delta, lowercase delta. So we can use the, the value delta to ascribe 
the negative and the positive. And that's just a variable we use to describe the polarity across the curve. Where is that in here? E N electronegativity. No, sorry. So the low electronegativity is slightly positive. This slight little positive region around that hydrogen attracts to the negative charges around other atoms. Just like we see here where we have a negative charge around the oxygen, it will attract the fleeing attraction called the hydrogen bond forms here within the water. Another way to put this, I may have atom, uh, an atom, I'm just going to call it atom one, and it creates a hydrogen bond between, I'm sorry, it creates a covalent bond um, with hydrogen. So the rest of the atom here is going to be more negative. Over here, we're slightly more positive, right? And then we have another atom, I'm going to call it atom two, where you have maybe a hydrogen here, so maybe this is an oxygen here, oxygen to hydrogen, there's the covalent bond, a little bit negative on this side, a little positive on this side over here. Nitrogen has a higher electronegativity, so this becomes slightly positive, the hydrogen slightly less, so it becomes a little bit more positive. I have a negative side and I have a positive side. These two portions of these atoms, they will attract each other because those opposite charges attract. It's a small attractive force that's fleeting. Water is really, really good at doing this. And we're going to see that water has these characteristics like cohesion, water molecules holding together to other water molecules, and adhesion, water molecules holding to other surfaces, like the surface of grass or the surface of the table. And it's all because of those hydrogen bonds that can form. In a water molecule, the oxygen, again, that's lowercase delta. The lowercase or the delta for oxygen is going to be negative. And the hydrogen, the delta is going to be positive. So we can create a hydrogen bond with the water. Uh, another example here would be ammonia. Ammonium is in three in nitrogen. It's higher electronegativity, so what would my delta value be here? Higher electronegativity around the nitrogen. More negative. And how about over here by my hydrogens? More positive. That's supposed to be 9 to 5 with the delta. I, I can't even draw it. Delta. Basically, looks, <laughs> doesn't look like that. Looks like a cherry. For a mentally retarded music note. Delta, positive where we have low electronegativity, negative where we have the higher electronegativity. One of the places uh, in biology that we're going to find hydrogen bonds is holding the two strands of DNA together. They are held together by hydrogen bonds. On their own, hydrogen bonds are really, really weak. Collectively put together, many, many hydrogen bonds become very, very strong. The next weak chemical bond that I want to talk about are called Van der Waals interactions or Van der Waals forces. Okay, so here's a simple atom. In the middle, it's positive. That's where the atomic nucleus and the protons are. And around the outside, we have the electron shell where the electrons hang out. Those are the negatively negative subatomic particles. In terms of the Van der Waals interactions, as we have 
these electrons floating around in their electron charge or in their electron cloud, randomly you can have a collection of those electrons to show up in one location within that electron charge. So all the electrons end up on one side of the atom. So we get this random electron motion that eventually we get this a collection of electrons in one part of the molecule and it creates what we're going to refer to as a hot spot. So we create this hot spot of focused charge within an area. Yeah, all atoms can do this. So if we get two oppositely charged hot spots, so on this side here we got the negative, on this side here we got the positive, we can create an attractive force. Notice that it has to be within five nanometers or less, so it has to be really close together for this hot spot, for these two hot spots to attract each other. And so they would more or less stick, right? So they would be attracted together. Again, it's only going to last a very brief amount of time, which causes them to stick together. Now, you can actually, this, this would be called a dipole because you have the positive and the negative, two different poles. And you can create these in a little bit less random way. Glass, like the windows here, can actually create a fluctuating dipole. You ever seen a lizard crawl, crawl up a window? The, the molecules in the foot pad of that lizard are actually caused to become dipoles and they're attracted to the glass to hold the glass on. It's not because of suction on the suction cups on, on the feet of the of the lizard, it's because the lizard has this attractive force that's created through Van der Waals interactions to hold the foot with enough strength because of a large enough area of Van der Waals interactions that it can climb right up the, right up the glass on the window. Okay, so hydrogen bonds and Van der Waals interactions, two very important weak bonds. Now we're going to come to see that in water, the hydrogen bond becomes really, really important. Water is a pretty small molecule. Hydrogen bonds and Van der Waals interactions become really, really important in larger molecules. And in fact, in DNA, which you can see here, an example of double-stranded DNA, the two strands are held together by individual hydrogen bonds. You can see that adenine and thymine are held together by two hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine are held together by three hydrogen bonds. When I add up a bunch of these nucleotide ba bases together, all of their hydrogen bonds, that becomes really, really strong reaction. So many, many hydrogen bonds all working together is really, really strong. And it's really hard, we can't pull DNA strands apart, especially at room temperature. We heat it up, we uh, heat up a sample of DNA, and you can then begin to peel those two strands apart. But in normal room temperature or body temperature, you think your DNA is not going to just be moved apart uh, on its own. It's going to have to be forced apart with enzymes and things like that. You know that the uh, DNA is, is uh, in a double helix. You've all heard that term before. Um, 
the rotation to create the double helix looks like a spiral staircase. To hold that spiral staircase together, each base pair, each level of the base pairs, so each step, if you will, from here to here, the strands are held together this way because of the hydrogen bonds. They're held together this way in that double, double helix, the, the spiral, because of Van der Waals interactions. We create a positive side of the molecule and a negative side of the molecule on each of these. And then it's those positive and negative forces that help hold that rotated uh, double helix structure. There are other large molecules that are really important. We already got the time. There are other um, large molecules where weak bonds are very, very important. In protein, which proteins have to be folded into a native structure for them to even begin to have the correct function, those proteins are made up of hydrogens nitrogens, oxygens, and carbons all in chain-like molecules. And those organized hydrogens and oxygens, hydrogens and nitrogens and carbons and oxygens and nitrogens and all of those things get organized in such a way that different parts of an individual protein can form these weak bonds. That again, when we have many hydrogen bonds working together, they become very strong. So if I need to take this part of the protein and I need to attach it over here to hold it together, I can do it by creating a hydrogen module in that larger molecule itself. So we're not necessarily just talking about across molecules to hold those molecules together, it can be within larger molecules as well. Again, this is going to hold our three-dimensional form of the protein. If those hydrogen bonds or those weak bonds are forced to reorient, so maybe we do something, i.e. add heat or change the pH, around the protein, we can cause hydrogen bonds to work differently. And so then we reorient those bonds. When we reorient those bonds, we will invariably change the function. Because one of the things that you need to know to understand biology is we can change the shape of a protein by changing its function. We can go from having a pore that's closed to a membrane to reorienting the bonds so that that core is now open and allows sodium to cross from the extracellular and the intracellular to the enzyme itself. Just a little bit about um, molecular shape or shapes of molecules. So within a single atom, we know that the electron shells will define the orbits. Right, so if we have one energy shell, what orbital can we have? What's that? And what S is it? Yeah, we can only have a one S. If we have two electron shells, we can have the one S in the first electron shell, and then we can have the two S and then the three two P's, right? Two P one, two P two, two P three. So within a single atom, the electron shells define the orbitals. But as we begin to take two atoms and put them together, the orbitals become reshaped. So basically, when we form a chemical bond between two atoms, those orbitals reshape as they begin to share electrons.
DNA is an example of one of these molecules that has more than two atoms. Right? There's many, 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 many atoms in DNA. And so this little carbon here that's bound up to a little hydrogen, or I should say um, the oxygen bound up to the carbon, or the oxygen bound up to, uh, or the carbon bound up to the hydrogen, each of those little atoms, they're now going to have slightly different orbitals. Because those two more atoms, the orbitals undergo this reshaping process. This process of reshaping the orbitals is called hybridization. I do have an example here of hybridization. You can see that if I have an s orbital and a couple p orbitals, I get the sp2 hybrid orbital, which becomes this triangular shape. And remember that the orbital, this is just the statistical area around that nucleus where we should expect to find the electron. So I'm getting ready to share electrons across an S orbital and P orbitals. So when I create that chemical reaction where I'm sharing electrons between an S orbital and a P orbital, we're going to have that orbital reconfigured. Go through goes the hybridization. And new orbitals are going to form, in this case, a teardrop shape. So we go from that spherical shape and that dumbbell or hyper hyperbolic shape towards this teardrop shape. Now, what happens when I reorganize the orbitals, whether it's between an S and a P2 orbital or the other types of orbitals, I get some very specific characteristics that begin to arise. So, just to give a specific example, I have two hydrogens and an oxygen. Both of the electrons in the hydrogen molecules are going to have each hydrogen, one, one electron, in it one s orbital. The oxygen, we're going to have electrons that are in p orbitals that are going to be shared. They're going to be part of the balance electrons. And it creates these teardrop shaped orbitals and it gives me a very specific angle. So one Hydrogen and oxygen react to form water. The orbitals reconfigure, and I get a very specific angle. That angle, by the way, is 104.5 degrees. 104.5 degree angle for my water after its orbital reconfigure. And by the way, If water was at a 104.5 degree angle because of uh, hybridization of its orbitals, but rather it rehybrid hybridized, let's say for some reason to 104.4 or 104.6, life would not exist. The 104.5 is critical for life because it gives water some very unique characteristics that we'll talk about uh, probably beginning on Friday to help with the functions that are required to sustain life. Um, carbon, when carbon is involved in the orbital hybridization, a lot of times carbons will form tetrahedral patterns, which optimizes Basically, a tetrahedral, if I were to tie four balloons together, I'd get a, by their um, open ends, I would get a tetrahedral pattern. We basically have carbon in the middle, 
Looks something kind of like that, kind of like a triangle pyramid shape. That allows up to four bonding partners to, to bind up to carbon, and they're spaced out in such a way that each of those individual bonding partners can still have reactivity. When we get more complex binding, and uh, or more complex bonding rather between s orbitals and p orbitals and other types of orbitals, we in just simply are going to increase the types of geometric shapes that can be created. The more geometric shapes that we can create, because this all goes back to the structure or the shape or the form of a substance that determines its function, the more geometric shapes that I can create, the more function that I can get out of that molecule, right? So, just to, to, to give a, 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 maybe a different example, uh, baseball. The pitcher's mitt is different than the first baseman's glove, which is different than the catcher's glove, which is different than the outfielder's glove. And that's because each of those different gloves, the way that they're shaped, they provide a slightly different function for that individual player, right? And Tate's going to disagree with me. Um, yeah. my head. Well so the, the geometric shape of the glove determines the function of that player. And the same thing happens here. The geometric shape of a molecule determines the function of that molecule. Biology requires a lot of function, which means that we require a lot of different shapes. If we didn't have the ability to hybridize all of our orbitals into these really massive different uh, uh, shapes, these high level of diversity and geometric shapes, we could not have the same level of function that we have. We couldn't have the same level of complexity. So more geometric shapes just simply leads to more possible functions. All right, so this last thing that we're going to talk about here in the um, kind of biochemistry portion, um, we'll just begin this today. We'll finish it up on Friday. Is to deal with chemical reactions. You've all seen this before. Hopefully, hopefully you're doing some of this now in chemistry. You're dealing with chemical reactions. You know a little bit about each of the elements of a chemical reaction: the coefficients, the reactants, the products. You can make balance chemical reactions. What it comes down to in terms of biology. Even though this is important to be able to understand the uh, anatomy of a, of a chemical reaction, identify the coefficients, reactants, and products, to be able to balance it, in biology, chemical reactions come down to making and breaking bonds or reorganizing electrons. So a chemical reaction in terms of a biologist is just simply the way that we can make and break bonds with the intention of reorganizing electrons. Because remember, I got up on the table and I've already heard that one of you filled it. When I got up on the table last week, I got in trouble. I really did. I've been in trouble. I've always been in trouble. I've been in trouble twice already. It's about to be three times, but I'm going to keep on doing it. Because <laughs> it's a great illustration, right? Because your position determines your energy state. And so electrons before a reaction are going to be in a different position around the atomic nucleus than after the reaction. 
the difference in stored energy between reactants and products determines how much energy became available during that reaction, or how much energy was required to go from reactants to products, how much energy you were now storing, right? So we're going to make and break bonds to reorganize electrons so that we can manage and transform energy to be utilized and to be stored. All right, so what are the components? You can see several of the components here. The reactants are the starting material. The reactants, they undergo the chemical reaction and they generate a product. And those products are just simply the resulting material. I, I need to let you go, but let me just get in two more things. We also have an arrow, and the arrow comes in a, bun a bunch of different varieties. This arrow points in just one direction. We can have arrows that point in both directions. That arrow just simply indicates the direction of the reaction. So it indicates directionality. This reaction would indicate that we can only produce water. We can't take water and we can't bring it back to the reactants. What we're going to actually find out is the double-sided arrow indicating that reactions can go both directions is what's going to be most common in biology. We can take glucose and convert it into glucose 6-phosphate, and we can also take glucose 6-phosphate and bring it back to glucose. Glucose to glucose 6-phosphate releases a little bit of energy. Glucose 6-phosphate to uh, glucose is going to put a little energy back in. The last element here is the coefficient. And this gives us, gives us an idea of the number of molecules that are going to be involved. Okay? So in this reaction, we're going to need two molecules of hydrogen. Each molecule of hydrogen is going to contain two hydrogen atoms. We're just going to need a single molecule of oxygen that contains two oxygen atoms. Put them together, we get out two molecules of water. All right, go through. I'll see you on Friday.